think outside the box is to approach a problem or a question in a creative way. In the case of the two artists, Nellie King Solomon and Barbara Stoffaker Solomon, they take a critical yet playful eye to their chosen fields. Both trained as architects, but were never licensed, which might explain the way they establish the rules, grids, or frameworks only to challenge their very existence. At the heart of each unique artistic practice lies the confident ability to think and explore beyond the frame. Perhaps best known for her super graphics, graphics that are oversized to the scale of architecture produced in the 1960s, artist Barbara Stoffaker Solomon has worked in graphic design, architecture, landscape, drawing, writing, and more. Around the walls of the gallery, the exhibition features utopian drawings from her green architecture series, large ping pong paintings, and a recent series of alphabet drawings. There's also a super graphics intervention. In the middle of the gallery is a recreation from the 1990 exhibition, Visionary San Francisco at San Francisco Museum of Modern Art that features ping pong tables for play. Nellie King Solomon approaches painting with equal parts irreverence and admiration. The exhibition features recent and never before seen large scale works that use abstraction and realism to tell stories, resulting in experiential paintings. In lieu of canvas and brushes, King Solomon paints on the sharp industrial material of mylar, using custom wood and glass tools for pulling paint around in sweeping gestural marks. Bold colors and unusual materials like asphalt swirl about captivating the senses and revealing the tension between spontaneity and rigor that are at work in her practice. For the exhibition at Smoka and for the first time, the work of mother and daughter artists is shown in close proximity. While both artists explore the physicality of the space, they're also interested in the potential of performance of constructing art. And although their formal approaches are quite different, both are engaged in moving beyond established expectations of art, design, and architecture. As we look to new ways of doing just about everything, now is the right moment to encourage the out-of-the-box thinking that these artists so readily exemplify. So thank you so much for being here, uh, Nelly and Bobby. And I wanted to start by just acknowledging where we are in space and time. So I'm, I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona, Bobby's in San Francisco, and Nellie's in Los Angeles. And I wanted to know how you are surviving the pandemic. So maybe we can start with you, Bobby. I'm just working. I had so much work to do that I'm happy for, that I have to stay home. That's awesome. And Nellie? Um, a little bit of the same. I have to say I'm really grateful for things that are happening during the pandemic that, I mean, I guess they might have, they would have still been happening, but I think that working with you, Jennifer, and Smoka, and the energy from Christian Bruno, the filmmaker, my fabricator, like they've had a lot of really devoted energy that if it wasn't a pandemic, maybe we wouldn't concentrate as much as we are right now. So I'm pretty grateful for, I have a dealer, a museum show, and a fabricator. I don't think I would have had those things. We're all propelled by our, by our work, keeping us moving forward. It's so important right now. We have to, we, we can't pause in creating content and, and other things. We need to be moving forward. Okay, so I wanted to start um, just it, generally to talk about the fact that I, we've placed your work, I guess I have, in close proximity to, to one another for the first time. And so in, in thinking about how you both approach art, I, I guess I recognize that you question authority, that you are not afraid, um, right, to break these boundaries. So I wondered, Bobby, where, where that comes from for you. Is, like, is it a family trait, for example, or is it something that you learned along the way? Is it self-confidence? I don't know. What, do you have an idea? Well, one could say it's a family trait in that my, I remember my mother would hold me up when I was voting. I was three or four or five and say, pull any lever, they're all crooks. And my father was a lawyer and he said, don't believe anything anybody says. But I don't know who you mean by authority. I, I mean, I certainly, when it comes to lettering or my work, Believe well, I listen to Armin Hoffman, but I, and it's interesting. And I listen to him 
I'm doing a new book on the forms of letterings, more, more crazy, but playing with the form of lettering. And it totally, Armin would love it, but he never discussed what the words meant. I mean, you just did the words, you didn't read them. And then until I went, that you learned in the university, which in Basel was across the street, nobody went to the university, they went to the Kunstgewerbeschule if they were wanted to be a designer. Whereas when I went back to San Francisco, I went to Berkeley and studied philosophy and history and learned what the words meant. And so now I'm trying to put them together, but I listen to different authorities, not, not, not any, no, not husbands <laughs> or, or presidents, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Well, and, and maybe authority isn't the right word, but it's, it's working against the norm, right? So if there's a norm, you're not afraid to- I don't to understand break. what a norm would be that's so- Well, like the way things have always been done. So, no, I don't understand that. No, I don't believe you know? it. Okay, so for Nelly, um, now that you're working on mylar, so you're making paintings that aren't on canvas. So I would say that's a way of, of challenging that norm of painting in a, in a direct way. Um, what do you think, Nelly? I mean, I would corroborate with Bobby that it's not that we don't listen to any authority, but we have specific authorities that stay with us in our histories and I think merge those voices in ourselves and maybe those are what we're answering to as opposed to any authority of the given moment that's being given to us as an outside parameter. My relationship to Mylar comes to my relationship to architecture, which I have a relationship. And I really have a relationship to canvas and brush. I started in graduate school as a painter, as an architect. So my answer, yeah, I, I do pull from Cooper Union. I pull from Bobby's relationship to Armin Hoffman. Like I pull from Hoffman's principles like innately without knowing it. Um, not that they're ignored, but that they're synthesized simultaneously. So that there's something higher I'm listening to that may not be the question asked of the moment, but makes sense within the work. Bobby, we're showing nine of your ping pong table paintings, of, uh, a few of which are behind me now. And I wondered, because so much of your work is at a smaller scale, at that eight and a half by 11 size, what was it like to create such, a, such large works? At the same as time I did that, I was doing super graphics, which is larger. So, I mean, I, I either do the small scale at home, so I don't dirty the house, uh, or when I get a wall or, or whole whole building, you have wall to wall to wall to do, it's bigger than that. So, I mean, that doesn't bother me. And Nellie, your works uh, that we're including in the show are eight foot by eight foot and some are seven by seven foot. So how did you start working at that large scale? Well, I've always been attracted to paintings that are place as opposed to a thing. and. When I went to go work, when I was in CCA in graduate school, they had just built this enormous building that was still kind of empty, the San Francisco campus, there was this nave, and the back of it, I started collaborating with a friend, huge, and there was this bus washer, and he was washing the buses with such authority and simplicity, these like three foot wide brushes on a stick, that I wanted to paint like the bus washer what may wash the buses and sort of this confidence and clarity of the way that he had an, you know, an urgent, clear message about how he did each one. And I think the combination of the size of that space and coming out of dance and coming out of architecture, because I crawl on the work as I make it. So, and I treat it more like a kitchen floor. Like I work flat. I don't work up like it's art. I work down like I'm cleaning so that it's not intimidating and correct for parallax by climbing on ladders. <laughs> it's, it's very humble in what you can actually do. And I think painting is very related to like the body and an action that's most efficient the way that is. So Bobby, you were talking about the scale of the super graphics and we will have 
um, some super graphics in the gallery, which is the LOLs. Um, and when you described to me what the LOL referred to, you understood it as little old lady, um, not laughs out loud. So here we have these opposing walls, right? Like little old lady laughs out loud. So I'm wondering um, what does make you laugh, Bobby? What does make me laugh? Yeah. I don't know, not super graphics. <laughs> I mean, if that were real super graphics, I mean, the, the, the building had, had had limitations and there are also limitations. If I were there, I might have done something more daring or I would have done letters that were from floor to ceiling or much more something. But the fact that I'm not going to be there, I had to, I have to trust some paint, side painter in the, in the, in Scottsdale to do it. I, um, I made something very simple. And I, I'm also, I'm writing about how words are getting um, simpler and simpler to the point where they're all just acronyms now. You can almost talk in acronyms. Right. And you think it's your, um, do you think it's your training in design that is why you come back to the written word so much? Is that the relationship there? Or I know you also do lots of writing. Um, Design, we, it was just how they looked. And I did learn to, to letter. I mean, I, I have these skills that nobody seems to have anymore. Like, I know how to letter. It's that type. But I, I enjoy lettering. And um, I, I enjoy thinking about how, how the look of the word goes with the meaning of the word, or doesn't. Or, that's why I like making books, where I can go. For, the new book is crazy from the kind of expanding this subject. And it's a subject that the painters, I guess, have thought about. I know that a lot of philosophers have thought about how words would be, how look, you know, and even tried to um, think about it. And I can, can it's now at this point in my life, I've had so much of reading words and so much of making, drawing words that putting them together kind of just comes to be. And I like the idea that it's somewhat of a self-portrait. Well, little, little old lady that laughing out loud, that's a self-portrait. Yeah. Um, and, and Nelly, the new narrative series that we're including, which are these highly detailed, very colorful uh, works, are, in my opinion, much like a self-portrait. I don't know if you think of them that way as a self-portrait. Yeah, they are self-portraits, but they're also a portrait of the self in the times. So they're a portrait of the times. And I think I did them in a moment when we weren't ready to look at ourselves yet. And what's happened in 2020 like forces us to take a good look at ourselves. So it's, I think it's great that you want to show them. I'm really happy because they are um, works that scare some dealers or others get excited, but it's, it, what they do is they violate the sublime abstraction with all the content of everything of daily life that we're not allowed to talk about. Everything that's in the art world, more than daily life, but like one of them's about the art world. One of them's about our relationship to gas and oil. Another one's about our relationships to money and regrets and friendships and navigation systems and everything we're not supposed to be that the painting is supposed to transcend as a sublime object. So I wanted to violate them with that, which is totally a self-portrait. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the, the works on the other side of the gallery, I'm thinking that are much more gestural without, the, without letters or um, references to other painters or all of the things that are in the new narrative series. Um, those are still really interrogating the, the materials and our life and our reliance on, like you, like you mentioned, gas and oil and um, yeah. obsession with the road and all of these things. But they're, but they're in that very sublime way where you, you don't get hit over the head with it. Yeah, I mean, they're not dogmatic. Those don't um, spell it out. But I mean, the two that you've chosen to curate of this time of 2020 are Matchstick and Rattling the Pipes, which I painted during the riots during 
the fireworks for Brianna Taylor all around my studio. They're very much during this mismanaged pandemic and of this time of being, oh, you can go this way. Oh, no, you can't. Oh, oh, block. And they are portraits of the time and the portraits of how we are not able to process it at the time. So yeah, they fall into the sublime abstraction where they can be received without any of that, but they're fueled by it. I wouldn't know, I wouldn't set out to make those paintings without that going on. Also, another thing that I see is important in both of your works is the negative space. So maybe best understood through the, the series, the alphabet series in your work, Bobby, um, but also the super graphics and the way they work within the space. Um, the negative space is, holds its own with the, with the positive, right? The, the foreground, the background, or the negative and the positive. And so I wondered if you would tell me just a little bit about the importance of the negative space. That's from Switzerland. That's from Emil Ruder and Armin Hoffmann. The negative space is more important than the, than the stuff that you make in black. That you, the, the, the canvas, the, the plain white canvas, the plain white piece of paper, that's the essence of the painting or the, or the, or the drawing. Or, of, of, and so whatever you do, you do it, it, it's, it's somehow the white is more important than, the, than the, what you do to it. And that, that, I, that was just beaten into me and I beat it into Nelly. And I think it's just true. Even when I'm working with letter forms, I mean, especially when I'm working, the, the inside of, the, of a lowercase a, or all the different, the, the relationship from one letter to the next, and every little shape is totally important. There's nothing that's done by chance. Whereas Nellie's stuff is done by chance, but very carefully calculated to be beautiful. And also, the negative space is obviously important in your works. You leave a, and a lot of negative space in these large works. Yeah, I would argue that the marks are an excuse for choreographing the negative space. Like I come from the inheritance of Hoffman and Ruder and the marks often I'm like, I wanna hold this space or I wanna charge this space. And the first big painting that I made that was of this sort of huge series that I've gone on to keep chasing these ideas. I had come out of a double doors with Larry Sultan out of the old De Young Museum from their like archives in the basement. And there was this giant um, kind of sublime romantic painting of Niagara Falls. And it was separated more than you would think that a museum would have the guts to separate it. I mean, there was like 10, 15 feet between the two panels. And there seemed to be an infinite amount of water falling in the space in between those two paintings. And when I saw that, I was like, that's it. That's what I want to do. I want to charge the empty space. And that, I mean, of course, harkens back to what Hoffman does, what Bobby does. Um, so yeah, I do listen to authority and then I've inherited those kind of principles. Um, and every set of marks is also a way of just capturing empty space, which is why I work so large, because I want to catch the empty space. I want to cut it off. And actually, I want to borrow the whole white of the wall, which is why they're not on canvas or framed. I never want to frame on the edge, because I want the white of the wall beyond the painting to operate into the negative space. So the paintings sometimes have a deckled edge, like the one you'll be showing um, breaking up the concrete cloud. I'm having the fabricator reinforce it right now with aluminum and it sticks off. And the whole idea is that then you are engaging the whole rest of the white sheetrock, that the rest of the museum's engaged in the painting as opposed to it having hard edge. It's borrowing negative space from around it too. Definitely. I mean, I've always wanted to make a painting that's a di disruption in an architectural wall. So the idea, like I grew up in this sort of piece of Bauhaus modernism that my dad designed, and I always imagined this big wall erupting, and I think the paintings are like revealing the eruptions that I feel are going on in the walls anyway, and it's just revealing what's actually happening. It's, you know, that's my relationship, my uncertain relationship to modernism, I guess. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, and it's also underneath our culture right now. I mean, what we're seeing is the revealed rattling of our pipes, and they weren't not rattling before. We're just getting a glimpse into it, which is what I was showing in the new narrative series that people weren't ready to see at the time, but now it, we cannot look away. So that painting just reveals what's already happening. Well, Nellie, I know you grew up in, art, in an artistic household, um, but Bobby, I'm wondering about you. Were you, I know you were a dancer early on. Were you encouraged in the arts as a child? Were your parents artistic? No, no, I mean, the only reason I danced was my mother to make money. The only thing she knew how, she was a spoiled rich girl. All she knew how to do was play the piano. So she got a job playing at the San Francisco Ballet. So they put me in all the classes, free, you know. And then she played for Elisa Cancino, who was Rita Hayworth's aunt. And so I, I learned to be a Spanish dancer. And when I needed money, I could do that in nightclubs. Um, that was just what happened. I wasn't, nobody did it on purpose. And my father thought, didn't, certainly didn't, he was a lawyer. He th certainly thought art was unnecessary. And he thought I should marry a rich lawyer. No, I wasn't encouraged. But then, no, in school I did make a sketch. On, I, there was a, a one class of art. They still had cl art classes when I went to school. <coughs> and I made a, a charcoal drawing, and everyone thought, oh, that's pretty good. And my mother did. We walked, a, 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 the, the high school was a couple of blocks over Russian Hill to the art school. We walked over with the drawings, and we showed it to... That was before Jerry McKaggy, I mean, uh, uh, Douglas McKaggy took over the, the Art Institute. And uh, William Gore was the director then. And he, t he took one look at them and gave me a scholarship. So I mean, time I was about 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, I had scholarships there. And uh, with David Park and all of that stuff. So your mom at least supported oh, your, yeah, she, she, your artistic well, yeah, they just assumed I was, a, you know, I, she was a rich girl, and married a lawyer, that I would do the same. That's what you did. <laughs> and, uh, My grandmother used to tell me it's just as easy to fall in love with a rich man as it is a poor man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's kind of the way our grandmothers all thought, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> no, and that's why um, when I... When my first husband died and I needed to make money, the only thing I knew was painting. Cause, and so then I turned it in, I went to, and studied with Armin Hoffman and learned design so I could make, make money. Of course. Yeah, it's a real thing. Well, in those days, artists didn't make money, you know, but architects did. And I was paid as an architect as long as I was a designer. When you had a daughter to take care of, um, and I'm wondering, you're both mothers to daughters. Um, and so I'm wondering if you have any, what does it take to be a mother of a strong daughter? Bobby, you were raising Nellie uh, in the 70s and Nellie, you're raising a daughter now. I'm curious because I have boys myself. So what does it take to raise a strong daughter that is an independent th thinker um, which you, which you've done. Are you asking me or Nelly? Yeah, Bobby, let's start with well, you. I don't know. I had two daughters. I, you, you just, that I think, I think I just always treated them as if they were my best friends instead of like a daughter. And I, I think I never said no. I think, I think mostly it was let them do whatever they want to do. I didn't, I didn't have, there were no rules, and there were no authoritative fathers around. <laughs> and and Nelly, um, I think it's to get out of the way. I mean, I have a daughter who sings, and she like used to change her clothes five times a day. And I think, also when I used to teach, I think that the job of a good teacher is to see who somebody wants to become, and instead of trying to railroad them into what your dogma is as a teacher in terms of your own work, is to see who they want to become, and then try to give them a lattice to get there. So I think that that's what I do both for my daughter, and also it seems like I have like a flock 
of rotating preteen girls who are always hanging out at my house. And I think that I'm like kind of their other mother. And like there were a bunch of them in Sausalito and now here in LA, one, you know, a few of them are evolving into the game. And I think it's a chance to give them the room to be who they are and trust them and give them some structure and take them surfing and listen and yeah. Because I think that little girls kind of know who they are already and they're really pissed that nobody hears it. And as soon as you listen, there's a lot of content there and then you get your infinite trust from them once you've listened to them. Then those girls helped me raise my daughter. Recently I, I watched the documentary on Joan Didion and I had no idea but her, her family came west with the Donner family. Did you know that? Um, but they obviously took a different turn. Um, and so I wondered how long, I mean, you're both born and raised in California, so I feel like we can't not say something about California. Um, uh, but I don't know, uh, Bobby, how, how many generations back uh, in California or what brought your family to California originally? My, my grandparents on both sides came about 1870s from Europe. And they never talked about Europe. They loved California. So I know very little about, and my, especially my mother lied so much. I have no idea where my grand, her, her mother came from. And my, my grandfather, he was, he was marvelous. He was an inventor, he was a Russian. And he, he went, I know he went up uh, to, to Yukon, to the gold rush. And, um, they just loved it here. And um, what was the question? <laughs> that. How many generations back? And, you know, but they loved it here. I mean, we used to, and my father, I remember we used to pick up my grandfather at, at work. He worked at the American Can Company. He was inventing the machines that canned peaches and apricots. And we'd walk along the Embarcadero now, which is so fancy. And he, they just loved to walk along the Embarcadero and look at the boats. And my father would just take me fishing in Sausalito and sit on the pier. They loved being here. And they never talked about the past. What came before? Mm -hmm. Both Bobby's family and my father's family go back in California. So I joke that it's like five generations California, which is impossible because you have to add them together. But I think that what Bobby was speaking to is that they're really the first modernists, where you really completely scrubbed off history. I mean, Levy became LeVay, became We're Not Jewish. To, there's a lot of rewriting of history in the family. And when you asked this question while I was filming with Christian Bruno about artistic influences in my family, I mean, it made me sit down and start doing this slow bubble diagram drawing that Christian came back and later wanted to film that goes into all the different makers in my family. And they're actually, despite whatever my mom says, there are quite a lot of them. And a lot of them each were reinventing what was needed at the time, be it fiction or dresses or hats or just survival in particular circumstances in California that are based on what was needed that was their wits and their creative powers and whether it's, I think I realized in you giving that question about family background and artistic influences, the two strongest influences to each of my parents were their earliest influences were each filmmakers. So my mother's first husband was Frank Stoffaker and he was early art and cinema. He had these magical experimental films. And I think those went into her hugely. And then in turn, those went into me. And then my father's first big role model in his life was Leonard Freeman, his uncle. And he was Hawaii Five-0, Hang 'em High, Route 66. So like heroism and like machismo and violence. And I think that when I was thinking about like, why do I make these paintings the way they are? Like sometimes I don't get it. And it's like, yeah, it's that magical, experimental, heroic, and violent. Like it all comes together from their earliest sources for each of them. So I kind of see a lot of it back there. And yeah, I pull from them, even if I don't know it sometimes.
I think that's, it's just a really lovely thought for the moment that there's something beautiful in all of those influences. The things that are, are difficult or that um, are not, or the heroic and the, and the violent, right? That they're, then you can, you can find the beauty in, in there. Well, you're allowed to address that in film, and I like to address it in painting. So maybe one thing uh, to discuss would be the title of the show, which it started as outside the frame, um, which, did, which for me goes back to that idea of question authority or go away from norms or not be afraid. Being bold, really. Um, is part of that and as we were developing the show and it and it moved in time and space due to um you know all the circumstances of the world uh i guess nelly really you started thinking about um a different title for the moment because the moment had changed um, yeah from where we were thinking about a show in december last year to where we were thinking about a show in April, May this year. Do you want to say something about the, about the title? Sure, yeah, I had been, I was thinking about your title, I think it was Beyond the Frame, no, Outside the Frame, and we, I started bringing it up in conversation with my mom and then we had a three-way phone call. And I think I started pushing for Beyond the Frame, no, just Beyond, because I feel like in this pandemic and at the times of this summer that was so intense and so felt laterally across all different parts of the world and our society, nobody can see beyond what's coming. And also that each one of these works in a sense attempts to address beyond and the whole structure of the show, like if we can turn it into a happening, how do we take the work and make work at a time when we're living into a piece of history we couldn't yet imagine. We've definitely lived beyond what we could picture, like the American dream and the ways in which America knows itself to be heroic from World War II. We've now played it out beyond so far we're into really uncharted territory. And so coming out of the Breaking the Frame title, I think it just pushed into beyond to me. What resonated for me is I feel like we're still going to be asked to go beyond, like that, that kind of endless beyond <laughs> yeah. that we don't know even still. Um, and Bobby, after we had this discussion about the title and beyond, you really quickly just sketched out the letters um, and sent it to me. I like it as a word. It, was, it looks you good. You like the word yeah. beyond. Beyond. I like it. Yeah. yeah. I agree. I mean, I think chance, beyond, words like that are sort of, that's it. It's the beginning of something. Yes. And that you don't know. And you, you don't pretend to know. I'm, I'm very sick and tired of people who think they know. I think you don't know. We don't know what we don't know. Yeah. And it's okay to not know. Well, it's not, I mean, we have no choice. We don't know what we don't know. I think that ties back to Bobby's lack of reverence for authority. Like her, her father taught her not to trust anybody that nobody knows. I mean, she tried to, she didn't get gold star in school. And so he bought her a whole package of them at Wool's, Woolworths. Um, and it was similar, like I asked questions when I was little and she showed me Wittgenstein's duck rabbit, you know, that everything was relative. So I think that we're now living into this place that is, admitting that we have no idea what's going on and that we don't have the structure and the answers. And I think that actually that's kind of more real and comforting because I think we've been in that space for a while but didn't know it. So in a way, yeah, that turns it to a more hopeful title because maybe we're admitting we don't know what's going on. Hopefully we survive through all of that. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say thank you then to both of you for being here um, through Zoom. We're so excited to share your work with the community and really with the world because we have, um, through all of these new platforms, opened up, uh, opened up ourselves to new audiences. So um, really appreciate you participating in the exhibition and I just want to say thank you.
Jennifer, I want to say thank you back. I couldn't be more honored or lucky at this time in this fragile chunk of history of how to navigate life. I moved to LA and you gave me a museum show. I want to really thank you. <laughs> it's a dicey time and you've made it a lot more um, fruitful. Thank you. I, I agree. Yeah. Our work is going to propel us forward. So keep up the good work. Thank you for inviting us. I, I, I've enjoyed immensely working with you, and I love working with Nellie. We work together so much, and I love that. Yeah. I'm very thankful because there was certainly, you know, a risk when you invite two family members, no matter how close, to, to, be, to take their relationship into a whole new space. Right. No, uh, Nellie and I work together often, all the time. You work really well together. Yeah. So. Well, I want to thank you for making it public that we work together, because my mom and I have worked together on so many projects over the past 20, maybe 30 years, and nobody seems to know it. It's always kind of this hidden thing that we know. Nobody's ever asked us to show together. I know Natasha Boas realizes that we're related and can see the influences, but you're the first person to ask us to have a show together and talk about the way that we cross-pollinate and influence each other, which has been constant through both of our lives. And thank you for making it publicly real because it's always been sort of like this private joke. <laughs> Well, that's my that's my small contribution, right? Is the uh, to breaking those norms is like you know there are some very interesting things that we don't talk about necessarily that that we can talk about and we should talk about um, because I'm fascinated at how how we can raise creative people, how we can foster creativity in individuals, how we can keep that alive. It's it's something you know when you work in an institution, you have to advocate for all the time. Um, so it's a, it's a beautiful thing for me. Yeah, Bobby has been really helpful and instrumental in keeping me going forward. There were like moments after graduate school when you think, oh, should I go get a real job? And I'm in my studio and I don't have any money. And she's like, oh, just shut up and paint. Here's a thousand dollars, go to Home Depot, buy what you need and just shut up. And that's really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for Bobby. <laughs> That's nice, yeah, that's true, yeah. Yeah. <laughs>